something that you know we share together today that sparks you off as as you know you might be already writing a book but it just sparks you off and then you've got it as a record to keep and um stick it in your journal I've, I've got so much random stuff in my journals that lead to my books so start with a doodle today um and then maybe at the end we can share the doodles wonderful well we're at um we're at a good number now and i have started a recording of our lecture so i would like to hand over to aditya who will introduce our speaker for the evening thank you mrs trafford and good morning assembly absolutely wonderful to see everyone gathered here this evening i would like to say a few things about our guest speaker uh, Sita Brahmachari is a, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, is a world-renowned author and a very active ambassador for ch children's rights, so kids just like you and me. She has also written a variety of books, winning her the Waterstones Children Books Award and has, re and has uh, retained the place in the Guardian's top 50 books celebrating diversity since the 1950s. A few books to mention are Artichoke Cards, Mira in the present tense and Jasmine Skies. All wonderful reads. With that, I'd like to welcome Mrs. Brahmachari to the stage. Oh, thank you so okay. much. Let's <laughs> give a nice little clap. That was such a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. Well, it's a real honor to be with you in this international school um, of human beings of all ages, which is what I think all schools should be. And in my stories, I write stories which are called intergenerational novels. That means you don't actually just include, you know, children of the same age. They're not just about 12 year old children or 16 year old children. They're about all of the people that are in our society, our families, our friends. And I think of my characters when I write stories a bit like amazing trees. Now, you might have already started doodling if you have. That's brilliant. Everyone might want to doodle an amazing tree and think of an amazing tree that you know in a forest or somewhere that you go that you just love that tree. It's like a magical tree or a memory tree or it's somewhere that you go that you feel at peace. I remember that tree when I was growing up in the Lake District as a little girl. It was a tree with a hollow in it and it was by a river and I used to sit in that tree and I used to daydream. And I used to come up with stories and doodle and just, you know, let my mind wander. Anyway, I want everyone to think of that tree. And then I want you to think of yourself. And you, I want you to draw some roots for the tree. And on the roots for the tree, I'd like you to write some, maybe some words about, you know, where you feel like your roots are in the world. And they might not just be in one place. They might be in lots of different places. And mine would be India, the Lake District, um, where my cousins are, Canada, all over, uh, all over the uh, um, Germany, all over the place where I have like links and contacts, Norway. Um, and then you, and then you can you can do do more of that later when we finish this session. But then I'd like you to think of the trunk of the tree, and the trunk of the tree is like where you are right now. Like I'm in London right now. And maybe on the trunk, there are a few things which are about your reality right now. And then I'd like you to draw some branches of your tree and think about how your branches of your family and your friends and your inspiration spread out in the world in all different directions. And that is what I do to start all of my stories. OK, I would like to be a bit like the character of Pat Print when we're doing this session, who is the writer person in Artichoke Hearts. And she says, I would like you to interrupt me whenever you like. OK, so if I've come up with some idea of my own storytelling that you've just had a thought that you'd like to interrupt and put your hand up, please do it throughout this session. I think Harrison might have his hand up. Just wanted to say, I think you should start a minding, mind, mind, I can't say, <gasps> mindful calmness channel because the way you talk is very calm and it calms down your mind. That is a very good way. 
to like oh. like just make a profit on YouTube or something for those streaming and <laughs> stuff like that streaming programs. Oh, on, that know. is so that is so lovely because you know for me that's what writing does for me personally. It puts me in a place where I flow with my ideas. I told you about that tree that I grew up beside and I used to sit and dream all my stories. Um, that's what writing does for me when I'm kind of flowing with ideas. I don't know if anyone here has had the experience of when you're really into doing something, whether you're drawing or you're, you know, you've got an idea for a story and time just goes by so quickly and you think, oh my goodness, it's just 10 minutes since my daughter was at school and I haven't even got up and had a cup of tea and here she is back from school and I've been just writing all day and I've been in the flow. I wonder if anyone's had that experience when they've been doing creative work because that's how it is for me when I write. It's kind of a place to go, my writing. And when I was your age, Harrison in particular, when I was about your age, I was really shy and I wasn't the sort of person that spoke much at school or to anybody really about my stories. I sort of didn't think somebody like me would be a writer ever. My dad was a doctor and he came from India in Calcutta in 1959. He was a great storyteller as well. And my mum was a nurse and she's lived in the Lake District. And in our family, We'd have books, but I never looked at books and I never saw like families like mine that had these diaspora branches that went out into the world, that had these different cultures and identities and religions. And we have these big conversations when I was you know, a child between all of these things. I never found that in the books that I was reading. And so I started writing my own stories, but the way I started writing them was by doodling. So this is a recent book that I have been um, uh, writing called When Secrets Set Sail. I wrote it in lockdown and I started it by drawing this river. Now, I don't know if any of the older members of this school will know, it's a very horrible speech actually, in my opinion. Um, it's called The Rivers of Blood Speech by a man called Enoch Powell. And it was a speech in the 60s, in the, sorry, in the 70s, that was about spreading hate really and not spreading love. And my dad, when I was growing up, he told me how horrible this speech was and how it affected him personally. And I always remembered it since when I was your age, Harrison. I remembered this, this, the way that my dad used to tell stories about these things. And in my storytelling, all these years later, I drew a river, and it is a red river, but I didn't, I said rivers of blood turns to rivers of love. And so I was kind of transforming something in my storytelling. And so I knew that I wanted from this doodle, you might think doodles aren't important, but from this doodle came the whole of my story when Secrets Set Sail, which is about a woman who travels the sea from India to bring the child of an English family to England on a long ship journey. And then she comes to this country and then she can't return home. So it's a story that's a kind of historical story. It's an imaginative story. And I mix all of these things up in my journals and in my doodles. So my notebooks for my books contain like stamps from when I was a little girl that my, my cousins from India used to send me letters and I used to put the stamps in, 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 in my drawer. And then I realized that that was gonna be an important thing in the story when secrets set sail. So that's why I've got you doodling and daydreaming. Has anyone doodled something? while I've been talking that you think, my mind is really quite random. I'm not quite sure where that even came from. Has anyone done that while I've been chatting away? I think somebody's got their hand up, let's see. Okay, Hafsa. Hafsa's put their hands up, so they've been doodling something that is kind of random. I think that- Hafsa, do you want to, to tell? Tell C to what you've been doing. Oh, um, yeah. So uh, I've sort of um, gone with a tree that has the roots all over the world. And it has like the memories of the world as well. Like like how nature uh, always remembers what, what happens in the world. And it has all these memories. Oh, it's beautiful. A memory tree. 
and you know that's the sort of thing that inspires me thank you in my in my storytelling so there's 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 a tree there's trees like that in my story red leaves which is set in a london wood and in this tree the the a girl aisha she goes through this tree and on one side of the tree is london where she lives and on the other side of the tree is somalia where she wants to get back to her her family and speak to them so she moves through the tree and out to the other side and she can transform into another place so trees are so magical for storytelling and they appear in lots of my stories i love that memory tree does that, did anyone else draw anything that they, they thought oh i'd like to pick up on that and maybe write my own story namita um i drew a dead tree and it reminded me that um that everyone goes through rough patches but if you just continue ahead it will just blossom into a big beautiful pink tree so yeah oh that is absolutely beautiful things can change and things can change i'm going to namita i'm going to show you i don't know if you know my stories but this is the front cover of where the river runs gold and can you see there's a tree on the front of this book um and the tree is also a lung you can see that it's like a lung if you've ever seen pictures of a lung it's like a lung as well so it's kind of like a breathing living thing just like you were talking about and even though something might seem, might seem dead, dead you actually, actually make maybe able to you've seen trees that seem dead and then suddenly a branch grows out and it's alive and I think that's such a hopeful thing that's something I try to put in all of my stories it's like a journey and the journey you know may have difficulty like you said Namita most of us do have difficulties in our lives at some point um, sometimes they're shared difficulties like um, war like the war that is happening in Ukraine at this moment in time and in other places in the world like uh, and the environmental crisis of the world, looking at itself and how it's dealing with the planet. Sometimes they can be communal things, and sometimes they can be, you know, things that happen in your family that are difficult or in your community. So those are the kind of things that when I start to write, I think about those things. But I'm always looking for like transformation. I'm always looking for that new branch to grow out of something that is difficult, just like you described. Wow. I, the, the frustrating thing for me, Miss Trafford, is I can't see all these beautiful doodles, but maybe we'll find a way one uh, one day to share, to share some ideas. Yeah, maybe they could hold them up to the camera next next time. Lovely. Um, there are still hands up, but maybe right. you want to move on and, and we could yeah. come back to that. So I, so I thought I'll just share the screen. Oh, no, I wanted to show you one more thing because I love objects. Okay, Objects are great inspiration for me. So I've told you, I want to show you three things before I go to the PowerPoint sharing screen. One thing is this shell, and this is a really, really magical shell. I know that other people will have like magical objects that they've got. And they're magical maybe because somebody has given them to you that is very important. Or maybe they're magical because you remember the day that you were given the object. Um, or maybe they belong to an ancestor, they've been passed down generations. This is another thing that inspires me in my stories. And in my story, When Secrets at Sale, this shell is brought by the nanny, the child carer from India on the ship when she comes in the 1930s. But the children of, the of today find the shell and they want to know the story. So for me, storytelling is a bit like that. And there, but there's something special about this shell. Sometimes all of our stories have not been written yet. So sometimes we can feel like I did when I was a little girl, like, oh, stories aren't for me. But what this, the children of today do is they, they listen to the shell. I mean, what should, should you hear if you listen in the shell? Definitely, you should hear the oceans and the sea, but no. Something's blocking it, blocking it. So they go inside and they dig something out. They work hard to dig something out. And they find inside is a handkerchief, or they think it's a handkerchief, but actually it's a part of a sari that the lady from a past time 
has cut out from her own sari and she's written her name lucky on it and she's embroidered a pomegranate. And then the children put the conch back to their ear and they can hear her voice and she's speaking to them and she's saying across the seas of time, she's saying, if you believe in me, set my spirit free. And because they believe in her and they want to know her story, they piece together her story, they find different parts of her sari and they sew them together and they discover what her story is. So for me, writing stories is all about really carefully listening to the stories that are out in the world and then bringing my imagination, my wild and random imagination to my storytelling. Okay, and I'm not going to say too much about this because I'm going to show you in the PowerPoint, but this is the painting palette that my mother-in-law Rosie gave to my daughter um, before she passed away. And it contains many of the paintings of her life, my mother-in-law's life. And for me, this is a very precious thing because it's not about necessarily publishing your novels. It's about the process of creating something that you want to express yourself. I think most writers, even if they never published a book, would keep writing because they need to express something. There's just a couple of people with their hands up and then I'll go to the PowerPoint after we've answered those questions. Harrison has his hand up. Uh, this is all about um, the author of Charlotte's Web, E.B. White, I think that's his name. Um, one of his admirers sent a, um, a letter saying, why would you write a story? And then he goes on. I'm not going to cut a long story short. I can't remember when I did this. I think it was an assignment. But he said he loved animals and a book was a sneeze, which means a book is a sneeze, which basically means he, it's by accident you create a story. But and also do it. There's, it just defeats the meaning if you were to just ask the um author for example if there was a um a riddle what is the answer to the riddle you have to really look at it and think about it and read the story behind it and he says every single thing in your house has a story to it if you look closely at its past you'll see it come true wow that is so that is that is that's that rings so true to me um about where stories come from Sometimes when you're writing stories, it's almost like the story is coming through you. It's like it just has to be told and you're the person that's got to write the story. And sometimes then you like you're serving the story. It's like my purpose here is to serve these story and these characters in the best way that I can. Devanshi, you have your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to say that I actually also used to write stories, I still do, um, on my computer. And uh, this one time, I actually found it was really cool. Uh, this one time when we were going to go to sleep, and um, my little sister, she said that she wanted a bedtime story. So I was just wondering of a story. And then I started telling the story and I basically made it up as I went along. But I stopped halfway because she'd fallen asleep and I and normally when I make stories it could go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was and then and then I paused and I started to think about what I just told and I was like, that's actually a good story. I and found did, a good story on that. Did you write it down? Yeah, I did write it down, I think. That's so good. Never throw your stories away. Never throw your... This is why the palette is so good. Because if you look at the palette, um, my mother-in-law, Rosie, she must have painted many orange paintings and many blue paintings. And if you could actually feel it, it's got loads of textures and there's lots of green. There's, there's loads of green. It's very... So you know that she did paint it in lots and lots of green. And I always say that if anybody was to, I've got lots of paintings that my mother-in-law gave me, but if I was to lose any of the, anything, if I was to lose this palette, I'd be really upset because it contains so many of the paintings of her life on it. 
And it also, you know, I've heard so many children and young people saying, oh, you know, I set out to write a story and it wasn't like I wanted it to be. And so I threw it away or I gave up on it. And I said, no, 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 don't give up on it. Put it in your palette notebook. And your palette notebook can contain just tiny pieces like a train journey ticket or stamps or you know, a little doodle that you've done or two lines of a piece of writing. Put it in your palette notebook and then later you'll be writing something and you go, oh, I remember I thought this thing. I'm going to my palette notebook. And then you get to your palette notebook, you take a little bit of that colour and you put it into your storytelling. So that story that you were telling to your um, sibling, you know, that may one day like be the, the story that you end up, you know, making into a bigger story or publishing as, as it is. But don't, don't just leave it behind and think that's a thing of the past because stories live with you. Some of the stories that I've written, I started writing when I was very little. I think that, I mean, you can see that on, in a quote on my PowerPoint. I'm going to try, and lovely to see your faces, I'm going to try and share my screen, um, see if I can do that. I'm not very good at technical things, but I'm going to give it a go. Let's, let's try. It worked before, didn't it? Screen share. I'm right here. <laughs> screen share um okay let's see and window book journey share please work oh slideshow from beginning can you see this everybody brilliant fantastic can you see how there's my palette that we just see and this is an amazing writer, Willa Cather, American writer. And she said, most of the basic materials a writer uses are gathered before the age of 15. I love that quote because, you know, sometimes people think you've got to wait to be a writer. But it's true that all of these books that I've written, more or less since I plucked up courage when I was about 40 years old, all of these books, the ideas came to me when I was doodling and daydreaming in my tree trunk when I was a little girl in the Lake District. So you can see these are some of the stories, not even all of the stories that I've written. And you think, wow, how has Tita written all of those stories in such a short space of time? But as I told you, I've been writing them since I was a little girl. I just didn't think that people would, would think of my stories as stories that they would read. There's a picture in the left hand corner of the screen of well, my family growing up in the Lake District, a mixed race family. So our roots and branches traveling all over the world. And there's a picture in the middle where of me and my dad and my brother by a river in the Lake District and rivers and the natural world are a great inspiration for me. For me. And there's another picture of me the first time I wore a sari when I went to India and looking very shy. And then that's kind of me in recent years too. So I think that, you know, the stories that we tell they all carry a little patchwork piece of ourselves, like Harrison said. It's like, how do we piece together these magical objects? Um, there's my dad's hat that he came with. There's a photograph there of my dad arriving in 1959 um, from the big ship journey um, from India to be a doctor in the National Health Service. He used to tell stories about how these doctors underneath their great coats um, were wearing little tank tops to keep them and warm in the in the British winter that their mothers had knitted for them and they as they took their coats off they realized they were all wearing these tank tops and so I think I'm sure you've got people in your family maybe you want to doodle um, or friends who are great storytellers and I was always interested in listening to the storytellers as I was growing up um, my mum and my dad were great storytellers and you can see here a picture uh, an artist drawing of my dad, which go, went into a book called The Book of Hopes, which was published in lockdown. And I wrote just a little story about how his caring spirit passed down to his children and through his children to the stories that they tell in the world or the things that they do. So inheritance is a really important part of my storytelling. That's the book and the shell I've told you about. And then this is a really important thing, not just in storytelling, but in anything that we do in the world, how we can make an impact in the world, is like dreaming. Dreaming what things can be 
um, like you were talking about the dead tree, it can be difficult, but then looking about how things can grow again. So this is the kind of dreaming room that's in my story when secrets set sail. And it contains anchors and it contains sails and it contains enormous portal windows. Um, and the portal windows are like in a ship looking out onto a really, really wide global world. And you can see if you look far in the distance, you can see the steering wheel. So the house is kind of like a ship and that whatever, wherever we live, whatever flat we live in, whatever house, whatever room we're in, in our imaginations, finding the anchors, the things that make us feel whole, and also the sails, the thing that allow us to use our imaginations to sail. And also to reading and writing and activism for me is kind of opening that portal window and actively stepping out into the world and saying, okay, I can steer this journey. I can find a journey to steer myself through sometimes difficult times. And um, I, that's why I absolutely love this image that is in the front of one of my books. It is in Artichoke Hearts and it is Mira's first doodle. And not only is it Mira's first doodle, but it's how I started my very first book by doodling randomly an artichoke and some words. In that story, the grandmother gives her grandchildren an amazing and beautiful artichoke charm. And she says to her grandchildren, um, love is a little bit like an artichoke. She said, as people get older, sometimes they grow tough layers around their hearts. And that is because, um, you know, the tough things that happen to you in life. So that bit of the artichoke you don't eat. But as you get closer and closer and you peel away the layers to the heart, that's where the important things lie. And she says to her grandchildren, never lose that open, loving, trusting heart that most children have because that's the most important place in life. And that's the inheritance that she passes on to her grandchildren. I don't know where it came from in my random imagination, um, but I carried this artichoke heart charm, um, which my husband had made for me after I wrote the book, um, with me through all of my books. And all of my storytelling is about um, unpacking the layers of the human heart so that even characters who you might think, oh, that person is so cruel, that person is so mean. That person is so wrong in the way that they think. I am interested in finding out what makes those people and those characters, you know, become who they are. And for us to open the portal of empathy. This is a little bit of my, I think I was about nine or 10 on the left-hand side, my nine or 10 year old doodling and writing. And in lockdown, I was asked to write a World Book Day story and ended up writing a story in free verse called The River Whale. Um, and then I could not believe it, but after I published it, I was going through some notebooks and I realized that I had actually written almost the same words that are in the book when I was a child. This is the mother-in-law that I told you about who becomes Nana Josie in Artichoke Hearts. Her essence goes into my storytelling in Artichoke Hearts. And that's my uh, daughter. And I just wanted to write a story about an amazing grandmother and her amazing grandchildren. And I wanted to talk about people who stand up for human rights, which Rosie did. She wasn't like, you know, she wasn't the head of any organization or anything like that. She was an artist who wrote, who did beautiful, you know, childlike paintings and things. But she also cared deeply about things like the tree that was going to be felled on the heath where she lived in London. Um, she wanted to write letters about things that she thought were wrong. So she would write to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. She would um, write to the local MP and she would try and stand up for the things that she felt were right in the world. And so these people, and you can all think as you're doodling of people who are in your lives or who you've met, maybe fleetingly, who are kind of the inspiring people that you don't won't put them in your books, but they become the kind of, they kind of like the energy source for you to write these stories um, about kind of a world that you would like to see lighter and brighter. So I love the slogan of Amnesty International where I'm an ambassador um, and because it is, and we can all sort of say this, it is better to light the candle and curse the darkness. I just love that. I just love that. That is the slogan of Amnesty International that protects people's human rights all over the world. 
And I'm really honoured that Amnesty International have read my books and feel like they endorse them as books that young people can understand and learn about their human rights, but also learn about empathy to other people that may not be like themselves. So with my roots and my branches that I told you about, I sort of then lean into other people's stories and I try to think, oh, well, what are their roots and what are their um, you know, trunks and what are their branches? And that's how my storytelling goes. So in Tender Earth, because it is a Tender Earth, the baby in Artichoke Hearts becomes the narrator. And she has a friend at her school called Parry, who is from Iraq. She's a refugee from Iraq. And Parry at school does not have enough food to eat. Um, she does not have heating in her house in London. Um, in, even in the winter, the electricity has to be turned off very early as soon as it gets dark. So Lila, in that story, she is making friends with somebody who lives in a very different way than she does. But together, as in all my stories, it's a journey of hope. These young people are kind of like we are together here. They are coming together to kind of find energy to go forward and make some light in the world. And that is whether I'm writing about the future or the past, that's always the journey of the young people in my stories. And I wanted to kind of write quirky stories and funny stories and, you know, stories that you could write, read when you're on the bus on, you know, on the way home from something, you know, short stories. These are Barrington Stokes stories. Because I think I was, I wasn't diagnosed as dyslexic as a child, but I think I, I think I am dyslexic the way that, and I think that um, people, that's why I was very late to learn to read. I used to doodle and daydream, but I wasn't really reading till I was much older. And so I'm very proud of these books that I've done with a brilliant publisher called Barrington Stoke. And it's, they're published on a thicker paper and um, they go through an edit so that it doesn't become too complicated if you're dyslexic to read them. Um, but these are also some of my favorite funny stories with funny titles to them, which I've enjoyed writing. I cannot believe I'm showing you all these books. I sort of have to look behind me and think, who are you talking about writing these stories? Because my recent novel, When Shadows Fall, is for the older uh, people here. He's an 18 year old boy and he's looking back on his journey through life up to that point and he's writing his journal. Kite Spirit is set in the Lake District, which is my spiritual home. And Red Leaves is in London with all sorts of young people coming together and living together under the same sky. So my books are also magical and they're influenced by magical things. And the real world can be magical. Um, but on the left, you'll see a snake. And the first line of my book, Tender Earth, is there's a snake in the kitchen. Well, I live in London and that's my kitchen. I couldn't find the beginning of the story, Tender Earth. I had all the rest of the plot worked out, couldn't find the beginning. I looked behind me and there was a snake in my kitchen in London that had escaped from somewhere up the road through, into, through our garden and into our house. And all my family were laughing, saying, oh, mum's making up stories again. I was going, no, there is a snake in our kitchen. That became the beginning of my story, Tender Earth. This piece of amazing graffiti was the inspiration for Where the River Runs Gold. It was done by a young man who um, lived locally to here and he did it in a place which was just full of bins and rats and not a nice place to be and he transformed the landscape with his amazing art so those are inspirations these are people at the refugee center in Islington that I work at it's called the Islington Center for Refugees and Migrants where we do this sort of storytelling everybody needs this sort of storytelling and sharing and doodling and making and wandering especially people who've had terrible pressures of trying to survive unbelievably difficult journeys um, through war or through the um, ruination of their environment um, through, through you know, corporate greed or um, you know, somebody poisoning their river. You know, these are all of the kind of stories that I hear at the Refugee Centre. And some of these things I try to, not the people, but some of these stories I try to place in my, in my books so that people have a better understanding of what it's really like to be a human who has to leave your homeland to go to another place because nobody would choose that. So that comes into my stories too. And I have been on lots of marches. I'm sure you have been on some marches too. And I've carried slogans and some of these slogans I've put in my book. 
And I love this slogan from Where the River Runs Gold, which is dare, dream, believe, and imagine. Because it's kind of what I do when I'm writing. Um, I also like to collect, I'm inspired by young people. I like to collect things that other people um, care about as well. And sometimes I do little doodle exercises like this one in Kite Spirit, um, which is a book about mental health and young people. And it says, the world expects me to be. And then I basically got everybody to write an alphabet and then just quickly write down what they feel like the world expects them to be. And then the next question was, I want to be, and then you did another alphabet. You might want to do that, you know, after this session. And as I said before, I'm inspired by people of all generations. And um, I met these amazing, amazing people who were Jewish refugees um, um, at a march um, and, and at a vigil in London. And I just, I just love them. And I just, these are the people that, you know, these quirky meetings sometimes with people um, can give you the inspiration uh, to write stories. And young people that I've met and that I meet um, and the passion that they have for a fairer world is something that really keeps me um, inspired as a writer for young people. I love this. I love their placard that they were holding up. And then this thing about coming together, which we're doing now, um, and I want to take your questions, that it's kind of like we can come together in so many different ways. I don't know if you can see me, but myself and Jane Ray, we wrote this story for much younger readers called Swallow's Kiss. And it was inspired by the amazing people at the Refugee Centre. And this lady here, who's got the beautiful dress on, who is welcoming little Amal, the amazing puppet who walked from Syria to raise awareness for the plight of refugee children. This lady is called Angel, and I've worked with her for many years. And it was so inspiring because she, not only the book turned into a play, which was put on at the South Bank, and then the people from the refugee centre came together and they sang the songs that we sing in the choir and they welcomed little Amal and performed in the play. For me, that was like one of the best days because it was like all of the things that I care about in human rights, in storytelling, in working with amazing people. Um, coming together in one place. And for me, that's what stories are about. And Angèle sang this song and the whole of the South Bank was singing this song. It started in um, Lingala, in her home language. And it was, um, it was it's called Tine Simonia. And um, it was, it was, um, it means we are together, we are family. And I think, you know, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because I want to come back and see the human family that we're all part of. Um, and th that's for me, that's what all of these sort of sessions are about, like spreading that understanding. I hope you're all still there because I'm not quite sure what's happened to my screen. Um, oh dear. I had this problem before. Yep, we're all still there. Okay, glad you're still there. <laughs> and we, we can see you. We okay. can we see you. Okay. Yeah. We can't you see might you. just need to move your mouse down or something or up and then it will all appear. Um, I can only see the screen. How did I do that before? Did mm. I press escape? Do you remember? Mm. We were scared to press escape. <laughs> I think. Okay. I don't know. I think you might have just moved your mouse down or... No, I don't. I think I did press escape. Mm. Mm, go for it. Try escape. You can always rejoin. Okay. Um, now, where did you come to? I think there you are. Hooray, you're there. <laughs> okay. So I felt like I, I sort of gave you a little tour of my inspirations. And now I'd love to hear your responses um, to that. I've got lots of books here and I can choose to read a little bit to you, but I'd love to hear your responses um, to some of the things that I was saying. Shall, shall, I let, shall I let you choose, Miss Trafford? Oh, your, your voice is muted, Mrs. Trafford. Lovely to hear from Ahmed. Lovely. Ahmed? Thank you. Um... I yes. used to write briefly, but I mean, not, I don't really do it much now. Um, it was mostly 
influenced by school, but uh, I am kind of a storyteller. I'm, I'm, I'm an actor and I always found um, find, you know, where people find inspiration. So, you know, in just random places in, in life and converting into any medium of art. So fascinating. I mean, you think of Bowie, who's such an amazing multi hyphen. I mean, I saw his documentary Moonish Daydream previously and, you know, I got to see just how he traveled to Berlin and randomly and isolated himself and just took so much from the world as a whole. And I think that I just I'm really just personally want to say that I'm very passionate and appreciative of, you know, how much people can draw from life and steal these little things and kind of use them for their art, which, you yeah, know, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you. I think, I think the whole the whole world is a palette of inspiration when you're an artist, I think. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And um, Sergei? Uh, yes, so um, I was interested to know, um, uh, do you view our stories as individual beings or a portion of yourself somehow morphed into words or a sort of duty or pleasure that you must do to yourself or something else entirely? Yeah, so that's that's a really interesting question, actually, because I think sometimes it starts with your it starts with an engagement that you've had, maybe with, you know, a quirky engagement or something like that, or a feeling that you've had or a strong feeling you've had about the world. And then you kind of, so I, so when you go to a publisher, they say, um, could you please write a synopsis about what you're going to write about? Like my synopsis, like my, any editor that works with me knows that my synopsis is just not going to be the story. Because the I self, the ego is maybe there at the beginning. But as you start to write, your books get populated by all of these other forces and these characters that are kind of almost coming from your unconscious mind. And quite a lot of my writing I do after I've been dreaming. So I've got a dream notebook as well. Very annoying for my family because I sometimes get up in the middle of the night and write the dream notebook. Because I think sometimes, you know, the I self is not conscious of how the whole of your being is sort of processing the world. And in some ways, that bigger way, bigger consciousness is something that is much more interesting for other people, because that is when you're getting to a communal consciousness, as Jung talked about that a lot. Um, and I worked a lot in theatre. And so I've always been very interested in like the symbolic world and the way we connect with people in ways that aren't necessarily logical, which is why I do love storytelling for children and young people, because you will be accept that somebody passes through a tree in London and comes out on a Somalian desert. If I set it up right, if you want to go with those characters, you will go there. And so by the time I get to that point in a book, really, I've sort of shed my skin of Sita and I'm serving this, this book that is coming from me. And in some ways, I don't feel, I know this feels odd, I think I've heard other writers say this, I don't feel I have much choice at that point, even if my editor sometimes says, oh, Sita, you know, I think you know, it'd be really good to end it here. And I would be like, nope, that character cannot end there. That character has to have this journey forward from there. Even if it's not the sensible thing to do, I kind of have to do it for the characters in the book. And quite often I have worried about my characters to the point where my children, I'm like, Mum, what? If, why is your face like that, say, at breakfast? And they're like, oh, well, I'm really worried about Jude Jackson. I mean, this thing is happening to him. And blah, blah, blah. and my son used to say, he's not real. And, um, you know, what's for breakfast? <laughs> and, and I'd be like, oh, but he is so real. He's so real. You get so wrapped up. You've got to. I think you owe it to your readers to deeply care for your characters. And so it really doesn't become about you in the end. And in a funny sort of way, I know this sounds like modest and humble, but I really feel this. When your name is on a book, it always feels like a little bit of a lie. Because you think of, like I always have long acknowledgements, because you think of all of the things that have happened that have taken you to that place that have allowed you to write that book. And really, all of those people's names should be on the book. Amazing. That was very inspirational question and an very. inspirational answer. Fantastic. Um, Xenia Zen has her hand up. Xenia's in Namibia. How magic is this? 
Hello, Sanya. Hi. Um, so if I understood correctly, you only started to publish your stories later in life. Um, so what or who kind of motivated you to um, finally publish your stories? Oh, Zenia, um, so it was my, you know, the lady with the palette and you saw her picture with the letters. That was my mother-in-law, Rosie. And I was walking along just over there. I was walking along the pavement in London with her. She was very poorly. It was towards the end of her life. She had cancer. And um, she was very frail, and you don't know how tall I am, but I'm pretty tall. Um, and she was very small. Um, you don't do feet, but anyway, it's five feet. She came up to my shoulder. She was very frail, walking along the road. It was the summer holidays as the children were coming out of school, really excited. And they were doing what I call taking up the pavement. So the pavement's narrow, the children are excited. You know, anyway, young people have a different kind of spatial awareness. They were just being themselves and moving through and they didn't see us and they literally knocked her over and she was so frail. And I just don't go around raising my voice at people really, but this voice came out of me and it was like, excuse me, please come and say sorry. It was really a kind of like, whoa, I was like, oh, see. Anyway, she was like, don't make a fuss, don't make a fuss. But these young people, because most young people are amazing, they came back, they were very tall, towering over her, and they came and said, oh, really sorry, ma'am, we didn't see you. Anyway, Rosie was such fun and she was chatting to them, walked back to our house. And by the time we got back to the door, she was like, um, oh, what are you doing for the summer holidays? Oh, I wasn't very good at math. Oh, I was good at art. Da, da, da. She'd made a relationship with them. So we said goodbye. We came in. I gave her a cup of tea and I remember her hand shaking and she put it to her mouth. And she said, do you know, Sita, when I was young and beautiful in a time before people took photographs all the time, um, people used to take photographs of me and, you know, because of the way that I looked. She said, but in those days, I didn't really have that many good stories to tell. She said, but now I am old. I have so many stories to tell and I am completely invisible to young people. And there was this like feeling, there was like this fire in my belly that I've sometimes had in my life when things, I've seen things that are not fair, like, or experience things like racism or th things that I just think, no, this is just wrong. I had this fire and it literally came out of my belly. And I said to her, Rosie, you know, I've always been writing stories. She said, yes, I know you're always writing stories. What are you going to do with them? I said, well, I'd like to write a story about an inspiring grandmother. She went, well, I've always thought I should be more famous than I've been. And that was the start of writing Artichoke Hearts. It was like, like the previous question, it wasn't about me anymore. Oh, will my book get published? Da, da. It was about, whoa, I've got to do this thing. And most young, the reason why I love working with young people is because most young people, like the protective heart, are in contact with that fire in their belly. And some adults are, but some adults sort of lose it a bit. And, you know, as you go through life, oh, I can't change this, so I'm not going to do anything. So that's the day. I can literally pinpoint the day. It's a really good question because most authors can, if you ask them, they can they can say the moment that they went, no, I'm just going to get over myself and pick up the pen. And it's a line that actually some of the characters use in my book, get over yourself and just do it. <laughs> and that's what that was the day I got over myself and picked up the pen. That story I showed to my husband and he went, see, you've written a fiction. And it was after my mother-in-law had passed away. You've written a fiction, you've imagined all of this stuff and done and the charm and then you must send it somewhere. I was like, oh, well, no one's going to read it. And then it did get published. And then to my absolute amazement, it won the Waterstones Children Book Award. And then all of these books that I've written since have come, have been hatched, if you like, not just from that book, but from the confidence. And this is something I really want to convey to you the confidence, the cultural confidence, the sense of, I can do it. I can make a, make a mark in the world. That sense um, has sort of brought all of these books that I'm sitting around. And it's kind of made me bring all of the people that I care about through Amnesty, through Refugee, bring them with me. Um, so, that it, so that I've never since then been that shy seater because, I mean, when I've been speaking, but when I've been writing, I've been like, no, 
I need to write a story of why is Lingala not known about in the world? And why is this little refugee child that I, um, you know, have met someone like her? Why is, does she find it so difficult? No, I'm serving these stories now. So yeah, that's a long answer. Sorry, but that's the true answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that question, Senya. And there's Christian who's got a question. We've got time for maybe one or two more. Christian? Uh, thank you. Uh, do you view your writing as some sort of a spiritual practice? Well, do you know, I don't think I've ever had such fantastic questions. I have to say, and I've been, I've been to many schools. I've never been to an international school like this with all different ages i'm just loving these questions i think i don't kind of set out to go i'm going to have like you know make this a spiritual journey when i'm writing a book but i think in all honesty the process of writing the stories enlightens me and i think i always it's it's a journey that i always learn things from and the minute, I think if I ever was to be writing a book where I felt like I knew exactly what was going on, that I was kind of like, almost like a puppet master pulling these characters in different directions and going, oh, this is this person, and this is this person. And they weren't teaching me stuff. I think I would stop writing. So I think for me, the kind of spiritual journey, and I have lots of characters in my books that also ask about spiritual awakening. Like that it's a big thing in my books. Like Mira is like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray to not sure who, not sure what. They all, my characters, some of them have beliefs of particular religion, some of them don't, but it, they're all asking the big, they're looking to the sky, they're looking to the stars, they're open to looking up at the stars on a clear night and going, oh my goodness, I am here. And so I'm wanting to place that into all of my stories, that moment of awe, I was lucky enough to interview David Almond on Friday and um, he's one of my favorite children's authors because he has a sense of the awesomeness of the universe as well as the difficulty sometimes of the real world and he always holds on to that and for me that's like a spirit the spiritual nature of things. Um, I also find it's not the kind of spiritual of another world but I also find this sort of connection spiritually very, um, it makes me grow, you know, because we all have moments where we think, oh, what am I doing now? What am I doing? I've done a Zoom before, or I've done this before, or how am I really going to meet people? And here I am actually meeting people from and feeling that sense of absolute awe that I might never have done another Zoom or school visit before. In this moment, I am feeling a sort of spiritual consciousness of being together and the questions that you're asking and meeting you. And also a sort of joy in knowing that these seeds will have been planted for you to kind of then go off and go, you know what? I'm going to write a book like this. Or I'm going to write a poem like this. Or I'm going to go on a march and hold a banner. I know it. I, don't, I haven't even seen all of you, but I kind of know that these, that books can do that, these sort of gatherings beautifully curated can do that as well. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thanks, Christian. All the way out in Melbourne, two o'clock in the morning. Um, win, win, win. What about win, win? You've had your hand up before and I missed it. I wanted to ask that, do you have any personal favorite books that you like, that you wrote? Oh, I mean, it's so difficult. It's a bit like I've got three children who are now grown up. It's a bit like the book you're writing is the book that you're nurturing, maybe when it isn't born yet. And you need to make sure it's healthy. You need to make sure you're giving it the right ingredients and the attention. So it's always the book that you're writing that is the one that you've got the most attention to. Um, but there is a book that I think and I'm going to I can show you a picture of it. It's such a tiny book. Look how tiny it is. This is the one that turned into the welcome book for little Amal. And I, I love this book because it's about collaboration with my friend Jane Ray, who's a wonderful illustrator and artist you might know. And look at the back page of this book. 
Um, so I said to her that in the end, this book must have no words, it must just have a picture. And the picture must, must be the culmination of all of the words that I've written. And what she actually ended up drawing was the community at Islington Centre for Refugees and Migrants that we work at. Not the individual people, but the feeling of the community. And I suppose I'm very grateful to this little book because it gave me that one moment of, of drawing together all of the bits of things that I do at Amnesty, at the Refugee Centre, as a writer. And it did it in poetry. It's got wishes for refugee children all around the world in different languages on the feathers of the birds. And um, I'm, I'm hearing from people that it's speaking to people right across generations because it's kind of a poem. So I'm sort of, I'm really, I really love this book because I can see that I'm going to Lithuania to talk about the book soon. It's one of my tiniest books, but it's carrying with it all of the kind of hope wishes that I have in the world. And it is a challenging world for children in the world today. And all of these wishing birds, children are now making because of this book. <laughs> so it's kind of got this charge in it. And, um, and it's this little girl blessing um, who puts her finger to her lip and she makes a wish for people all over the globe that they will have plenty and they will have enough because she's experienced what it's like not to have that. Um, so I, I'm a bit in love with this book. Um, and here is the blue door. It's partly because I've got Jane Ray's beautiful illustrations in it too. Here is the blue door at the refugee center that we actually work at. And she is sort of, with the little girl is pushing open the blue door. And instead of finding rejection, she's finding a welcoming community, which is something I've thought a lot about in these last years. And it's something that you know, makes me feel sad when people aren't welcomed. And so in a book form, this little book is all of the things I want about the world <laughs> and the people that I work with kind of want to see in the world. And it seems to have a power of its own. <laughs> Win-win's giving you a big round of applause here. <laughs> well, I'm applauding you too. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we, we're kind of nearly there at half past. I, I don't know if anyone has a super fast question. We could squeeze one more out of Devanshi, maybe. You've had your hand up for so long. Um, well, it's not really a question. Uh, it's sort of an agreement and sort of my opinion. But uh, when you said um, you don't like it when people are not welcomed and are just like, just treated badly because of partly who they are or what they like, I've actually somewhere sort of experienced this before yeah. um like this one time in my old school i used to have i thought i used to have a lot of friends but then i realized that they're not really my friends they're kind of just people who i know and i can't really trust them because whenever they need help, like this one time, for example, who I still think might be a very good friend of mine, uh, there was this girl called Katie, and uh, in our class, uh, I think I was in like grade two, um, I did something which I am still very proud of. Um, we were putting our hands up, to see who wanted to stay inside for break time and who wanted to go out on the field since there was this big field attached to the playground in our school and i put my hand up and uh three of my other friends uh katie katie and lucy they put their hands up too me and katie got picked to go outside but katie and lucy didn't and i was really upset that they didn't get picked because they were very close friends they i knew them since i almost entered the school um so Devanshi. i was really upset that 
Yeah. Devanji, I'm, I'm jumping in and I'll tell you why, because we've gone, we've gone up to half past. And I'm so sorry, because I know you are on a mission to finish that. <laughs> Will I say one thing? Yes. The best thing for me that you ended up telling your story and I want you to continue it. And it means it's important and the way that you feel is important. And all of my stories are about those rites of passage moments when you realize things and you're trying to work things out. And I think that's really important. So I think you definitely should write that down, even if it's only for yourself. And maybe you'll share it one day with those people and maybe it will create a change as well. So that was, for me, that was wonderful to end by hearing your story. Thank you. Yeah. A real inspiration and um we're, we're so thankful to you Sita it's been amazing I don't think I've, I would ever have got this out of them they have just been you know opened up by you and I'd, I'd love you all um to give her an, an enormous clap in your Cambridge Homeschool online way lots of little claps and um we are really um thankful to you and um Hope you go on to write many more books and um, we will enjoy reading them. I'm going to make sure we've got a new online library, so we will stock it full of your books. Thank you so Thank much. You. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank Goodbye, you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. It was lovely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> There we go.